ethos and persuasion through the character of the speaker. Be sure to pause and rewind the video at any time to take notes and reflect. Last time we learned about ethos, which is one of the three appeals. Specifically, ethos is persuasion achieved through the good character of the speaker. And this kind of persuasion works because there are certain characteristics that we find more and less credible in others. That is, we tend to inherently want to believe and go along with certain types of people over others, or at least those people who appear to be a certain way. Aristotle defined three essential characteristics that we generally find persuasive in a speaker. We tend to trust people who appear virtuous, meaning they are moral, humble, righteous, they have a proper sense of justice, or they are truthful. We also tend to trust people who are intelligent, meaning they have good uh, knowledge on a subject, or they're just generally reasonable or rational people. We also tend to go along with people who appear good-willed, meaning they have the interests of others in mind, not just their own, people who are selfless or benevolent. But beyond these three that Aristotle defined, we also tend to go along with people who appear affable, people who are just charismatic or likable, people who have that it quality that attracts people. People who are like-minded, meaning they seem to share our same beliefs, our same values, our same opinions. Those people that are just generally relatable or like us. Lastly, we also tend to go along with people who are authoritative, meaning they are powerful or influential. Perhaps they have real power or authority over us, or perhaps they just appear to. A persuasive writer builds ethos by appearing to possess these kinds of characteristics. These characteristics are just what people most commonly find credible. Remember, rhetoric is situational, which means that some characteristics will just be better at building ethos than others in a particular situation. For instance, a speaker appearing authoritative could either help or hurt them in achieving their purpose. This just depends on the situation. If the audience feels that the speaker's power and position over them is justified, it could help the speaker in getting their point across. However, if the audience feels the speaker's power and position over them is unfair, and maybe they resent the fact that the speaker has authority over them, well, then that could actually hurt the speaker. Think of it this way. If a leader was speaking to people they are in charge of, how much that leader is respected by the audience is really going to determine how much they can play into their authority over them. If they're a well-respected leader, then they could emphasize their position of authority and the audience would be more likely to respond positively to that. However, if they're an unrespected leader, maybe someone who is lazy or doesn't work as hard as the people they're speaking to, then they wouldn't want to emphasize their, their authority that's been given over the audience because the audience would naturally resent that. So how exactly does a persuasive writer demonstrate these kinds of ethos building characteristics? Well, it's all about the persona or personas that the writer adopts. This is why when we study a persuasive text, we separate the concept of the author from the speaker. And it's because in a situation that requires persuasion, the author, the person who is authoring or uttering the text, must adopt a persona or take on a particular character apart from themselves. You might think of it like wearing different masks in different situations. This is when the author becomes the speaker. The author must wear a particular mask that makes them appear most credible with whatever the situation calls for. Think back to Fred Rogers' testimony. What kind of persona does Fred Rogers adopt in this situation? 
Well, he appears to be someone who is respectful and humble. He appears to be someone who cares deeply about children and about society at large. He appears to be someone who is knowledgeable about child development and experienced in that field. He does this by thanking the senators for their time and being polite in his, his requests to them. He does this by saying that he cares about children and also by backing this up with evidence of his work in helping children. Finally, he does this by relating the expertise he has in child psychology and the number of years he has been working with children because the senators wouldn't naturally just know that about him. These are all different ways in which Fred Rogers builds ethos in his rhetorical situation through that testimony. And they are all a direct result of the rhetorical constraints he found himself working under. Because he was testifying before the United States Senate, therefore he made himself appear respectful. Because he was not widely known outside of his field, therefore he made himself appear intelligent and virtuous. And because he could come off as being greedy in this time of national recession, therefore he made himself appear good-willed and selfless, saying that the money wasn't to benefit him directly, but to benefit children and ultimately American society. This is how rhetorical constraints dictate the ways in which an author persuades. When examining an author's ethos appeals, you need to look at those rhetorical constraints that pertain to the speaker's character. For example, we can look at specific obstacles that pertain to the speaker's ethos. Ethos obstacles would be any negative characteristics that the audience may already attribute to the audience. Perhaps it's a situation where the audience believes the author to be selfish, ignorant about a certain subject, unrelatable, etc. And then the speaker must somehow change this negative perspective by adopting a more favorable persona. Rhetorical situations can also give us ethos advantages, however. These are those positive characteristics that the audience may attribute to the author. And this really only works if the audience is familiar with who the speaker is. But in these cases, sometimes the speaker is already known to be a virtuous, intelligent, good-willed sort of person. And in these cases, the speaker needs to rely on these characteristics and sometimes emphasize them. Lastly, there are certain ethos building expectations within rhetorical situations. Whatever kind of persona the situation would normally call for, that is what kind of persona the speaker should adopt. And if they do not, then that is noticeable and that is uh, perhaps some strategy that they are attempting or something that we can evaluate for its effectiveness. Also, um, the audience may just naturally expect a person to appear a certain way. Maybe they're known to be a certain way. Or perhaps the subject matter may naturally call for certain characteristics over others. If it's a serious subject, it's going to require that the speaker adopt a more serious tone or persona. If it's a more lighthearted subject, it might require that the speaker adopt an altogether different persona. Think back to Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. Some of the ethos obstacles he was facing are that as a black man, he wasn't considered to be as intelligent as a white man. And also, white supremacists have long taught and believed that black people were inherently brutish and violent. These, of course, are completely false and, and highly racist stereotypes, but these are the sort of ethos obstacles that a black man like Martin Luther King Jr. was facing in his speech. To overcome this, there are certain ethos building techniques that he uses. For instance, he uses elevated diction and these really elegant cumulative sentence structures to demonstrate that he is a highly skilled writer and speaker. He is gifted with language and thus intelligent. 
He also espouses a message of peaceful coexistence, which makes him appear virtuous and good-willed. Some of the ethos advantages that were working in his favor were that to a lot of his audience, he was known for his advocacy for equal rights for black people, which made him just naturally appear good-willed before he even said a word that day on the Lincoln Memorial front uh, steps. He was also known to be a Baptist minister, which carries its own sort of perceptions. It made him naturally appear virtuous. So what he does with this is he uses that to his advantage. He doesn't have to introduce himself or explain his background. He doesn't have to talk like Fred Rogers did about how long he's been working in advocacy. He was such a widely known figure that that sort of credibility was already there. Also, the fact that he was known to be a Baptist minister gave additional credibility to all of his references to God and religion and, and all of that because it just carried more weight coming from a, an authority on, uh, on Christianity, if you will. Lastly, we can look at the ethos building expectations within his rhetorical situation. Again, as a Baptist minister, there were certain ways he was expected to act. He is expected to appear diplomatic and civil like any sort of religious leader would. Also, since his subject matter is this terrible injustice that millions of people are facing, that required that he at least appear somewhat passionate and forceful. And so there's that delicate balance that he has to walk here between being civil but still forceful. And so the ethos building techniques he employs meet these expectations. He adopts a persona that is all of these things. He is diplomatic but at the same time passionate. He keeps his, his arguments civil but very forceful and fiery when need be. Ethos building is clearly an important element of persuasion. Without it, the author lacks credibility, and the audience is likely not going to listen to what they have to say. That's the end of this video. Go ahead and move on at this time to the corresponding assignment.